Tales of Zisteria is a game which has managed to spawn many adaptations, including the manga Tales of Zisteria Time of Guidance and the anime Tales of Zisteria The Cross. Adaptations are always a tricky subject because of how controversial they can be. Though an adaptation does not need to stay entirely faithful to the source material, and indeed sometimes that can be a bad idea, most fans of the source material want the most important parts to remain in the adaptation. Often, when an adaptation doesn't work out, it's because it doesn't retain the soul of the original work. So really, it's not a surprise that one of the biggest issues that Zisteria fans look for in adaptations is the relationship between Saray and Mikleo. With their relationship being key to the soul of the game, it should also be key to the adaptations. In this video, I want to explore how Mikleo and Saray's relationship has been adapted to fit the anime and the manga and to draw conclusions on the connotations of any changes made. Before I begin, this video will not only contain major game spoilers, but also spoilers for the anime and the manga. I'd recommend at least playing the game or reading the manga for a basis of the plot before watching this video. Or you could watch the anime, I guess. It's your choice. With Saray and Mikleo being the two main protagonists of Tales of Zisteria, their relationship dynamic is hugely important to the game and its key themes. However, the basis of a relationship often lies in how each character is portrayed too, so it's important to base the discussion of their portrayal in each adaptation in both their individual characterization as well as how their characters work together. It wouldn't be prudent to speak about everything covered in each adaptation and the source material, so I'm going to focus on five key moments which occur across the game and the two chosen adaptations of the anime and the manga. These these five key moments are the beginning, the argument, the revelation of the past, Saray's answer, and the epilogue. The beginning of each adaptation is the part with the least changes made to Saray and Mikleo, both in terms of their individual characterization and their relationship. This of course is natural, given that they must have adapted that one scene hundreds of times, including in the OVA Dawn of the Shepherd. With the first scene being so iconic to fans of the game, it's also crucial for adapters to make it recognisable to fans, creating a sense of familiarity which pushes viewers to want to continue with the adaptation even when it inevitably differs from the source material. The game begins with Saray and Mikleo in the Mount Mabinogio ruins, introducing the audience to Saray for only a moment before bringing Mikleo into the picture. In their conversation, we learn about their shared interest in history and the legends of the shepherd, but it is not until later on that we discover their one key difference, in that Saray is human while Mikleo is a seraph. This is key to the game, as it begins by setting up their similarities, which makes the dreams Saray and Mikleo share of having humans and seraphim live together in peaceful coexistence seem more attainable, since they've already lived it in their own relationship. The game also sets up a really nice parallel to the epilogue, which doesn't show up in either the manga or the anime, with Saray catching Mikleo as he falls. This scene establishes the support the boys have for each other, making us believe in their chemistry from the get-go. For the most part, the manga is entirely faithful to the game, portraying the same events in much the same way, save for the shorter time frame as Saray and Mikleo battle against Lunar inside of the Mabinogyo ruins upon discovering Alicia, rather than later on after they've already met Alicia. A few other subtle differences show up in that Mikleo creates a water bubble to save himself and Serene from falling rather than using Twin Flow, but most of the differences in the connotations of their dynamic show up later on into the manga, so I'll leave that discussion for later on. The anime is a strange parable, in that the first scenes we have with Saray and Mikleo do not occur within the Mabinogyo ruins, and yet we still have that same iconic first game scene halfway through the episode, once we've already been introduced to the characters. This makes the scenes which come before it feel unnecessary, since the Mabinogyo ruins scene works well as an introduction, particularly with the pan over Mikleo which matches perfectly to the one which introduces him in the game. Still, the added scenes show some of the smaller differences in the characterization of Saray and Mikleo which the the anime implements, making it an interesting point to look at in this discussion. Mikleo's first line in the anime defines the most crucial change made to their relationship. What are you thinking, wandering off on your own again? Sometimes I think you forget that you're just a regular human. By immediately referring to their differing races, we find a boundary between the two of them already presented to us. The anime sorts them into different groups, a recurring theme which shows whenever the Seraphim are shown off to the side, observing but not partaking in Saray's mission except for during battle. It also undermines the dream shared by Saray and Mikleo. Rather than seeing how humans and Seraphim aren't so different before learning that they're not both human, we learn that Saray and Mikleo have a fundamental difference before we get to see the similarities which are key to their relationship. The anime also immediately presents Mikleo as a kind of observer to Saray, with Saray having reportedly run off on his own, as well as some of Mikleo's later remarks when Saray speaks to him about the celestial record. Two worlds uniting, humans and Seraphim actually bonding together and talking to each other. Hmm. Certainly sounds different. 
The Celestial Record. You put a lot of faith in that book, don't you? Of course! It feels like they no longer share their dream, but that Miklio is supporting Saray as he attempts to attain this dream on his own. Fundamental to Saray and Miklio's development is the argument they have, which also relates to their shared dream. In the game, this argument occurs early on and provides a huge plot point, as well as an obstacle for Saray to overcome. The fact that Saray refuses to allow Miklio to become a sublord not only speaks volumes about Saray's character, about how he cares for Miklio, how he doesn't want to burden Miklio with something like this just because Miklio feels responsible for him, it also prevents Saray from progressing as a shepherd, as he cannot see the the Irish Gems or release the Armatus until after Miklio becomes a sublord. With the game, we also see the image of Miklio as an observer, watching from the sidelines as Saray gains a new squire in Alicia and as he heads north to the Galahad Ruins. The important thing to note here, of course, is that Miklio is frustrated with his position as an outsider. He is frustrated with his lack of ability to help Saray and he wants to be directly involved in Saray's mission. The reason he wants to become a sublord is not because he feels responsible for Saray, but because if Saray thinks becoming a shepherd is going to help towards attaining the dream they share, then Miklio wants to be a part of that too. This is our dream. The manga does a beautiful job of adapting the argument in a way which portrays Miklio's side of it even more clearly and with more power. By allowing the tension in the argument to go on for longer, with Sari already having Edna as a sublord before the tension breaks between him and Miklio, Miklio's frustration is allowed to reach bursting point, and when it bursts, it's forceful and real and true. We get to see how worried Miklio is for Sari, how he wants to return to a life when things were simple and there wasn't a chance that Sari was going to deteriorate. When Sari doesn't understand Miklio's feelings and frustration, too blinded by his own concern for Miklio and not wanting him to feel responsible, Miklio lets his anger manifest in the most shocking way it could have, and he punches Saray. On his blind side, may I add. I mean, he would have had to punch that side anyway, since he's left-handed, but the image presented by Miklio literally pointing out how blind Saray is to the way Miklio feels right now makes this scene even more hard-hitting. A thousand thoughts and feelings about his worries and frustrations all manifest manifest in that one hit, and it gives a new level of depth to an already important argument. Since we see so much of Miklio's side of the argument, we really begin to understand his emotions better. However, we still get to understand Saray's emotions, even through scenes which focus on Miklio. One of my favourite lines is when Uno tells Miklio this. Your friend's headstrong, he knows what he wants. If such is true, for what reason has he not made you a sublord? And yet despite that, or maybe because of it, you choose to keep travelling with him, am I right? Uno understands that Saray wants Miklio along on this journey with him. He questions Saray not having made Miklio his sublord when he clearly wants Miklio to be here, but he also understands that Miklio is more adamant on continuing on this journey with Saray because of Saray's refusal to let Miklio help out, perhaps in the hopes of making Saray see reason. And eventually, once Saray begins to understand that he needs to allow other people to help him, he communicates his feelings to Miklio in only a shared look, letting Miklio know that he's okay with this, if it's what Miklio truly want. Once again, the anime remains an outlier in that, rather than following the game and the manga, it changes the plot so that there is no argument between Saray and Miklio. This is perhaps one of the strangest decisions for the anime to make, since removing such a crucial chance for character development leaves Saray and Miklio feeling stagnant. During the argument in the manga and the game, Saray and Miklio are given a chance to think and grow separately, developing so they understand each other's feelings, as well as displaying their flaws. In the anime, when Saray and Miklio separate, it only cements the trust we already know they have in each other. One of the more aggravating things is that it removes the concerns and flaws that Saray and Miklio have in the game and the manga. Anime Saray doesn't have qualms about allowing people to join him on his quest, easily making Alicia his squire without asking Lila for all the details beforehand. Yes, with the pact comes great power, but the price you pay is your life. I didn't know about that and allowing Edna to become his sublord without complaint. They also make it sound as though Saray has never heard of a sublord contract before, even though it was mentioned by Lila in episode 4, though not by name admittedly. This makes it even more surprising that Miklio does not ask for more information on these packs, especially since in episode 7 he tells Lila that he wants to find some way to help Saray. However, Miklio does not actively ask for Lila's help in finding a way to help Saray, which removes the part of his character which is wholly concerned about Saray's well-being and helping 
helping him to the best of his ability. His telling Lila that he wants to help Sari feels unconvincing when he doesn't attempt to find ways to help him on his own. By removing the disagreement between Sari and Mikleo, which spawns from the worries that they have for each other, it downplays the development both of their individual characters and of their relationship. The middle section of each adaptation is where the larger divergences come into play, so it is nearer to the end of the story where our next examples arise, the first of which is the revelation of the past. The past is an interesting quandary in Tales of Zisteria in that each adaptation handles it quite differently. In the game, the past is used to give Saray and Mikleo understanding and to allow them to reach an answer about what they want to do to save the world. Though they are both involved in the past and they learn of this, neither is affected for very long. Both agree in a later skit that it is a life they can't remember and that the life they cherish most is the one they've spent growing up in Elysia. The only time any strong emotional reactions about the past are alluded to is when they discover Muse in the Mount Mabinogio ruins and Mikleo must let her go, even though he's only just found her. Though Mikleo is genuinely affected by this and Saray is empathetic toward him for that, they keep moving on in order to save the family they care the most about, i.e. the people of Elysia and Gramps. Ultimately, the past in the game is used to allow them to understand and to push them towards the future. However, the game's use of the past as a motivator does not work to the same extent that the manga uses it. The past has a surprisingly strong weight in the manga, emphasising Saray and Mikleo's role in it to the extent that it even shows their reactions in particular, focusing on them. When Saray and Mikleo march on to the final battle, they carry the weight of the hopes of those people who died in Kamon. Mikleo even makes tribute to Muse by pushing his hair back to reveal his circlet, and talking to Saray about how he believes his true name alludes to the hopes of Muse and the other citizens of Kamlan. The manga also increases Saray's part in the past by implying that his actual father is Heldolf, which is a thing, I guess? It, it makes sense, but I'm not sure what to think of it, to be honest. In any case, it gives the past even more weight, especially for Saray. If the game used the past to push Saray and Mikleo toward their answer, the manga does this to an even higher degree. Then there's the anime. When it comes to the past, in the anime it is shown to us without any warning, and it only appears for Saray and Lila. Even this change feels important to mention, since it excludes Mikleo from a past which he was crucial in, having been the baby which was sacrificed by the shepherd Michael. But I suppose that doesn't matter when the anime makes no mention of the fact that Mikleo was that baby, or that he was reborn as a seraph, though seraphic rebirth doesn't seem to exist in the anime, a notion which adds connotations to a scene which I'll mention later on. Saray somehow doesn't even notice the resemblance between Michael, Muse and Mikleo, despite the fact that he can clearly see the circlet on Muse's head and Michael takes that circlet with him when he goes to sacrifice Mikleo. Even in the game, Saray and Mikleo notice the resemblance before it is made obvious, something which the others pick up on when they are watching the past unfold. In fact, Mikleo notices it way earlier than that, with one of the first Irish gems they come across. By taking their part in the past out of the picture, it removes such a huge part of what makes Saray and Mikleo find their answer as well as removing Mikleo's importance entirely. It makes it feel more like this is Saray's journey alone and thus changes the effect of the answer which he comes to. Saray's answer is perhaps the most crucial part in each adaptation, since it is what brings the story to its conclusion. The scene in which he reveals his final plan differs in each adaptation, giving it a different weight and presenting different connotations depending on each choice. In the game, Saray confesses his plan to Mikleo, alone under the stars in Lastenville. His plan is foreshadowed early on, which makes it understandable that he's able to come up with this plan in advance, and since Mikleo was there at the time of the event which foreshadows Saray's plan, he understands it too. When when Saray tells Mikleo it feels important for it just to be the two of them. It grounds everything in the fact that they are the most important to each other. It's natural for Saray to tell Mikleo first, because it is Mikleo who will be most affected once Saray is gone. They've spent their whole lives together, chasing a dream they've always shared. Saray understands that he's hurting Mikleo's feelings by doing this, but he also knows that it is his only option, and he trusts that Mikleo will live through this and carry their dream forward until a time when Saray can return for them to live their dream together once more a sentiment epitomized by these heartbreaking lines. What about your dream? Weren't you going to go off exploring ruins around the world? My dream will live on, so long as I don't forget. Very well. 
In the manga, the journey's end scene takes place in Lady Lake instead of Lastenbell, and even then, we don't learn what Saray's plan is until the end of the final battle. Still, even though we only find out about Saray's plan later, it is implied that Saray already knows what he must do. He laments over having missed his chance to return Alicia's knife, and then gives Mikleo the celestial record, saying it's not an equal trade without giving Mikleo a chance to return anything to him. When he does this, he tells Mikleo this. I can't be sure the person I am at the end of all this will be the same as the guy standing here now. Saray knows that she has to go to sleep for a long time. That's why he knows that he won't get another chance to return the knife, and that's why he passes on the book which has brought him and Mikleo this far. He doesn't know what will happen once the purification is complete. Will he still be human? Will he even still be alive? Because he doesn't know these things, he passes on his feelings to Mikleo as a symbol of whatever new dream they find when they are reunited. Because, as Saray says, as long as we keep dreaming, our journey will never end. It is Saray's words to Maltellus later on, as he asks for his help in purifying the world, that cements the idea that Saray already had this plan in mind during that final conversation, and that he purposely did not tell Mikleo about it. Perhaps Saray wanted to be more considerate of Mikleo's feelings, to not hurt him by telling him of his plans to sleep for centuries. Still, it could also be said that Saray was more considerate in the game by letting Mikleo know about his plan, rather than just going off and sleeping for centuries without telling him. In either case, it creates a dichotomy between the game Saray who believes he should tell Mikleo, and the manga Saray who tries to spare him from the pain by not telling him. And then there's the anime, again. Saray comes up with his plan at the last minute, which doesn't seem to make any sense since it's not foreshadowed, nor is it explained how Saray knows this will work. Then again, this applies to most things in the anime. For whatever reason, Saray knows more about these things than it makes sense for him to know about, especially when the Seraphim do not know about these things, or have not told him about them. When Saray confesses his plan in the anime, he tells everyone because he has to. There's no time for him to take anyone aside and explain to them. Even though Mikleo's reaction to it is still the strongest, it's almost heartbreaking given that Saray doesn't have the consideration to think about Mikleo's feelings in the slightest. He tries to be considerate to Mikleo in the game and the manga, but in the anime his focus is entirely on Heldolf and trying to purify him. He does not give Mikleo a chance to even process the plan before he's jumping into the Earth Pulse with Heldolf, and suddenly Mikleo is alone. I think what I'm trying to say is that Saray and Mikleo's relationship feels a lot more one-sided in the anime, with Mikleo caring wholly about Saray, and Saray not giving him much consideration in return, even though they're supposed to be best friends who need each other more than anything, as was shown to us in episode 7 during their separation not argument. Anime Saray barely gives anything much consideration other than his duty as the shepherd, which changes his character into more of a caricature, an embodiment of the romanticised notion of the shepherd rather than a human being with flaws and interests outside of his shepherd duty. This is what makes the changes in the anime feel so much bigger, because it changes a fundamental element of Saray's character, which affects every relationship he has, in particular his one with Mikleo. The last key element I want to discuss is the epilogue, because it is an interesting insight into what comes after all is said and done. In the game, the epilogue is purposefully very vague, occurring an unknown amount of time after Saray goes to sleep, and showing only a silhouette of Saray when he finally appears. Because of its vagueness, the epilogue is up to interpretation, allowing the audience to fill in blanks for themselves. Obviously, it's very effective in doing this, since there are hundreds of different fan works depicting their reunion and everything which comes after it in different ways, some portraying Saray as a human, where others have him reborn as a seraph, which comes with its own set of connotations. It allows the audience to continue the story for themselves, taking it wherever they want it to go. It also allows room for Bandai Namco to manoeuvre if they ever decide to create a sequel or a follow-up, which depicts the events after Saray's awakening. With the epilogue, the manga is a little less vague about everything. Rather than occurring in the same way as the game, it takes place in Alicia. Mikleo, who is writing something, stops and heads outside, passing memories of himself and Saray as he goes, seeing those children going exploring, and then at the gates of Alicia before they left for the first time. The last shot we see is Saray standing at the clifftop where they stood so long ago, but this time there is no younger Mikleo there, where in the other two parts we saw both the younger and older Mikleos, here we only see the older Mikleo standing at 
at Saray's side, which implies two things. One, Migley was going on feeling as though Saray is still at his side, even though Saray is only a memory and not the real thing. Or two, this takes place after Saray awakens. The second option carries its own connotations, since Saray looks the same as he did before they left Alicia, implying that he may still be human if this does indeed take place after he reawakens. However, there's always the possibility that he is a seraph and hasn't changed much in physical appearance. It's still available for interpretation, even if the choices presented to the audience aren't quite as open as the ones presented in the game's epilogue. The anime's epilogue is the least open to interpretation of the three. When Mikleo hears Saray's voice, it is due to their Sublord Pact still being open, which implies that Saray is not only still human, but that he's also still the Shepherd. This implication is furthered by the fact that Saray and Mikleo can still armatize. The continuity doesn't really make sense, since Lila has been shown to be leading another Shepherd, and it isn't clear if Sublord Pacts work in the same way in the anime as they do in the game, where the Seraph works directly under the influence of the Prime Lord's power. If it does does work in the same way, it should not be possible for Saray and Mikleo to have a pact together, since it should have broken when Lila should got a new shepherd. But the continuity isn't the most important thing here. With Saray being confirmed as a human, likely still as the shepherd, it means that he will definitely die before Mikleo, and presents a more sombre tone in that respect. It also means that they're unlikely to have a peaceful life if Saray is still a shepherd, since he'll continue purifying the world from here on out too. This is something which Mikleo worries about constantly in the game and the manga, but has not been shown to worry about in the anime, which is another huge change for them to make to his character, impacting his relationship with Saray too. Their reunion is far less open to interpretation and feels more like a consolation prize for fans of their relationship than anything. Tales of Zisteria and its adaptations each place emphasis on the relationship between Saray and Mikleo in different ways. In short, when considering the game as the source material, the adaptations relate to it thusly. The manga expands on what was presented to us in the game and adds insight into Mikleo's character, as well as expanding on the past. It develops what we already knew more deeply, despite being the shortest adaptation and having the least room to manoeuvre, whereas the anime subtracts from the characters we already knew from the game by removing important traits and development, leaving a feeling of there being something key missing from Saray and Mikleo's relationship throughout it, and removing a lot of the importance of it except for using it as a lure for fans. But that's just my opinion. Obviously different fans can have different interpretations of each adaptation as well as the source material, so if your interpretation is different I would love to hear about it in the comments down below. I'm open to all thoughts, theories and opinions. Also feel free to yell at me if you actually enjoyed the anime because your opinion is valid and maybe I missed something you love about it. While you're in the comments why not let me know what kind of analysis videos you'd like to see next, I'd love to hear any suggestions you have. In case you didn't know I have a let's play here on this channel of Tales of Zisteria, which is at the time this video goes up on its 24th episode. New episodes come out every Monday and Friday. I try to do some analysis in those videos too, but they're also good to just listen to in the background if you're feeling bored, so feel free to check them out if you like. I'll leave links to the playlist in the description as well as in a card in the corner. I also do analysis videos, which you'd think would be clear given that you just sat through one, but just in case you missed the last ones on why Mikleo's best boy and how to react as a lens for the audience, I will link the playlist containing those in the same places. Also, apologies about the survey one. I rushed the editing for it and it ended up being a bit of a mess, particularly when it came to audio levels. I've tried to fix it for this video, but unfortunately I won't be able to fix it for the survey one, so I'm really sorry about that. Anyway, thank you so much for making it to the end of this video and for your support thus far. I hope you have a great day, night, or whatever other time it is for you, and I will see you next time. It's really good to see you, McLeo. You too. <laughs>